Wanted Bebop and Rocksteady is the beginning of a three-parter that ended the 2012 Team and T series and was the second main crossover with the 87 Turtles. I was really excited for another outing with the 87 Turtles, and after watching this crossover, I have mixed feelings on it. There's a lot to enjoy about it for sure, but I'd be lying if I said there wasn't things I thought that could have been improved with it. Now, to really properly discuss this episode, I'm going to have to talk a bit about the story from the TMNT 2012 series, so there's your stupid spoiler warning and all that. You ready? Booyah Kabunga! And such. I thought the 2012 series got particularly good through season 4 and 5 and really had a lot of darker plots. Throughout the whole thing though, it's had its fair share of body horror with a bunch of the mutations, but they really ramped up the grim plot lines and death in the later part of this series. They also tended to let a lot more serious moments in the show stand rather than immediately trying to defuse them with a joke, particularly in Season 5. Not always, though, and I felt Casey Jones was particularly bad about ruining something that should come off as a bit more of a serious moment. Like this one moment here where Donatello gets bitten by an alien bug and has his face horribly disfigured, Casey just laughs at him. <laughs> For all he knows, Donatello could die here. This just seemed particularly callous, really. Don and Casey have had a bit of a rivalry in the series due to them both liking April, but I feel like this should have been a moment to show a bit more depth to Casey's character, rather than him just being a jackass about it. 2012 Casey is probably one of my least favorite interpretations of the character, right down there with 87 Lawbreaker. Lawbreakers. April 2012, the character, not the month from that year, also really found her way as a character through season 4 and 5. Especially when she got the Kuno Each black jumpsuit with yellow stripes. I really didn't even like this version of April that much earlier in this series, but she really started getting more interesting towards the end when she became more of a competent ninja. She also gained psychic powers, which had an interesting arc to it, though I thought they made her a bit overpowered at times. The later part of Season 4 saw Shredder get turned into this series' version of Super Shredder and had some really cool fights with him. And we had the second time that Shredder killed Splinter in this series. And the second time, it actually stuck. It's kind of funny part of the plot of Season 4 had the Turtles time travel to save the Earth and stop Shredder from stabbing Splinter, only to have it happen again, but this time there's no cosmic redo. And I really do appreciate how willing they were to change things up like this. They also had a nice 1990 movie reference with Shredder getting knocked off the roof into a garbage truck after his battle with them. Oops. And that's my favorite Casey Jones moment from the series. After this, they even had Leo decapitate Shredder in their final battle with him. They don't show a lot, but they got about as graphic as they were probably allowed to within this series. And then Season 5 started with Tiger Claw summoning a demon to help him resurrect Shredder. Yeah, Season 5 got kinda weird. This final season also had a different intro theme and was called Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Which is what the comics that were kind of additional stories to the main one in the original Mirage comics series were called. And that's also kind of the feel of this season, especially with the main Shredder arc wrapped up. Season 5 is made up of different story arcs that last 3 to 4 episodes, save for one two-parter and one single episode. The one single episode was a flashback where Splinter is talking about his early days on the streets trying to avoid the Krang and take care of the infant turtles. I felt this was a particularly touching story, especially with it coming after Splinter's death in the series. It gives you a nice look into how much he really cared for them and what he went through. 2012 Splinter really is one of my favorite versions of the character. He's just got such a great presence about him and it was always nice to see stories that involved him more. 
Lone Rat and Cubs is also notable as it was actually written by Kevin Eastman. Now, they really went far out with the arcs they pulled in Season 5. The summoned demon, Cavaxis, does in fact resurrect Shredder briefly, but as the undead. Which even he realized by the end should not be. We do not belong here, demon. <laughs> The demon arc was particularly awesome, though, as they really started laying in the Ghostbusters references. Check it out. I found this at Ray's Occult Bookshop. Cavaxis even started bringing about the apocalypse, and the dead started rising, so the turtles made their own proton packs. <laughs> Well, we got the tools, we got the talent! I can definitely see why they made these TMNT Ghostbuster crossover figures. They did a crossover arc with Usagi Ujimbo, and the beginning part of this was written by that series creator, Stan Sakai, so that was pretty neat. They did an arc with the turtles facing off against all the classic horror monsters, the mummy, Dracula, the werewolf, and Frankenstein's monster. But still, probably the darkest story of this season was Raphael is Mad Max. Mostly because we learned that Raphael is capable of growing a beard. Weird. But seriously, this look at the turtles in a dystopian Mad Max-like future was really interesting and quite a departure for most TMNT stories, while also not feeling like it completely betrays the lore. This was also the original series finale, but they ended up switching it with the 87 crossover. The Dark Future one would have been a kind of bitter note to end the series on, but you can clearly tell by this image shown at the end that it was intended as the series finale rather than this crossover crossover special, which is also a kind of weird spot to end this series. Once again, we have everyone from the original 87 series reprising their roles, and this time we also get a bit of Barry Gordon and Cam Clark doing the original Bebop and Rocksteady. Oh, looks like it's the part where we get punched again. And I just got these shades, too. Kevin Michael Richardson voices the 87 Shredder in this, and I think he does a really good job impersonating James Avery's voice. Bebop, Rocksteady, it's time you earned your keep. Destroy those blasted turtles once and for all! And it really added something having the 87 Shredder be in this one, and it's really nice to see his interplay with Krang. Where did you take us, you alien ignoramus? Earth 7, a world parallel to our own. I thought the 2D animation looked a bit better this time than it did in Transdimensional Turtles, which really I was a bit easy on when I discussed that episode, because it was pretty stiff. They also put the 2D section in these episodes inside a full screen frame, even though they don't have many scenes in the 87 universe in this arc. The original Bebop and Rocksteady barely appear in this either, and never get to meet their 2012 counterparts, which is kind of disappointing. The plot of this has Shredder and Krang abandon their Bebop and Rocksteady to try and seek out and hire their 2012 counterparts. And you said putting an ad in the paper was a waste of time, and I like these headshots. Bebop has range. I suppose people in the 2012 universe are pretty numb to mutants and other strangeness by this point. All right, you bug brain baboons. <laughs> uh, sorry, force of habit. I found this really funny here that Shur just falls into insulting this Bebop and Rocksteady like they're the ones he knows, but he continuously does this through the story. You two booby-headed blunderers will be sure to screw this up. <laughs> And this leads me to one of the major missed opportunities I thought this story presented. I think they should have still had 87 Bebop and Rocksteady with them, and they see how much Shredder and Krang appreciate their 2012 counterparts and get jealous. These two are way more effective than those dim-witted mutant morons back in our dimension. This would also give more of a payoff to Shredder and Krang dressing the new Bebop and Rocksteady like the old ones. 
Thrones. Which I like that they did. It was just kind of odd from a story standpoint because why would they want to be reminded of their incompetent Bebop and Rocksteady? If they were there and they had dressed them that way to rub it in their Bebop and Rocksteady's face, it would have flowed with the story a lot better. They could have even had 87 Bebop and Rocksteady upon seeing how competent their counterparts are, reflect on what jokes they've become, and remember that at one point they were vicious gang members and were really hard for the turtles to take down. Oh, say your prayers, turtles. Oh, this is ridiculous. We're never going to stop those guys. Honestly, if a similar kind of awakening arc had happened with Shredder, I'd been really happy because I felt a bit too often they made him into a punchline instead of making him seem like any kind of threat, which only really happened a little in the final fight. I know Shredder and a lot of things got pretty silly in the 87 series, but I wish these crossovers wouldn't focus on that aspect so often. I think a lot of the time, people tend to forget that the original animated series ended with those Red Sky seasons where they tried to serious up the show a bit again. Really, watching those seasons back, it's kind of like watching a prototype of the 2003 series. And in those, it did seem like they're trying to make Shredder more threatening again. You sure bluffed your way out of that one. I never bluff. But Channel 6 is still there. I knew he was bluffing. I never bluff. I find it kind of odd that this series could forget about the Red Sky seasons, considering they had their own take on Lord Drag. Maybe if the Shredder had found out what his counterpart had accomplished in this dimension, particularly killing Splinter, it could have also been the kick to make him more ruthless. And this could have led to an interesting change in the dynamic between him and Krang as the story progressed. And I'm not saying that I didn't enjoy some of these jokes about the 87 series or that none of them are true, but it kind of went into parody slash exaggeration territory sometimes, like it did in Turtles Forever. A Technodrome? A ridiculous looking one, even by Dimension X standards. So how are we gonna infiltrate that thing? Why don't we try the open door? Quick, do something! These turtles are actually dangerous! We best finish off the turtles fast before they figure a way out. These accursed shellbacks deserve something far worse. Gloating! Now, I never really felt that the jokes about the 87 show were coming from a spiteful place like they did in Turtles Forever sometimes, but it got kind of irritating when they'd make the 87 turtles into oblivious morons. Dude, you found us! Shh. Thanks for the save. Turtle power! The turtle! I was really hoping this arc would be an opportunity for the show to use the 87 Turtles in a more serious manner, especially as we already kind of did the jokes about them and their series in Transdimensional Turtles. But instead, they kind of just repeat a bunch of the beats from that. What's up with the initials on your belts? Why is they having initials on belt buckles? That's why we called on you posers. Come on, we don't need those posers. We totally had this without you posers getting in the way. This isn't going to be as easy as it usually is. They even have Raph trying to break open a fire hydrant, which they already did in their other crossover too. It just felt a bit too much like we hit a reset switch on any of the development the two turtle teams had made with each other last time. You're fighting is lame. You have to learn to fight like us and actually use your weapons for once. But if I swing my sword at them, I could actually cut someone. <laughs> Man, I'm not against the 2012 Turtles telling the 87 guys that they've got to take things more seriously this time, but them acting like they never use their weapons is ridiculous. Strangely, Turtlepedia makes note too that this is the first time in nearly 20 years that the 87 Turtles use their weapons. Well, their show ended in 1996, so it's been nearly 20 years that they've done anything. 
I mean, ignoring Turtles Forever, which I mostly do because those were parody turtles, not even voiced by the right people. But this is also ignoring trans-dimensional turtles, where the 87 guys totally use their weapons in battle. We even get this shot of 87 Mikey not being able to deflect anything with his nunchucks, which kind of seems ridiculous considering in the original opening we saw him competently doing that. A huge missed opportunity and what I think should have been a motivating factor for both Turtles teams is having 87 Splinter show up. This would have been a really hard-hitting moment for the 2012 guys as their Splinter is now dead and I think would have really added something special. Show you it's kind of around the end of part two that the two teams start working together properly, and I just wish they hadn't have wasted time repeating things instead of developing their dynamic together further. Turtles fight with honor! That said, there was a lot to like about this crossover arc. 2012 Bebop and Rocksteady are a funny duo and do have a lot of genuinely funny moments together. Without us, they'd have no transmat chip, no crane crystal, no nothing, y'all! Da, da. True that. Do you want hug? Yeah, okay. A quick one. A quick one. <laughs> um, what are we laughing about again? Who cares? <laughs> and I absolutely love this moment where Rocksteady asks Shredder about his Wi-Fi password. We will need Wi-Fi password. A really funny moment with the 87 Turtles is when they finally meet the 2012 April and Casey and comment on their age. April? Casey Jones? No way! They're like kids! And I also love the way that they worked in a joke about April's jumpsuit. This April is way too young to be wearing a jumpsuit. Are you even a reporter? Why? Do reporters wear jumpsuits where you come from? Of course! What kind of backwards dimension is this? They break out the robotic foot soldiers in this special, and I thought it was a rather humorous reference to the original foot soldier toy with the bow-legged stance they enter the room with. Part of the plot of the fourth season saw Karai try and bring Honor back to the Foot Clan with her friend Shinigami, who was kind of a weird witch ninja, but I rather dug her. And I really like that this gave them the opportunity to have good foot soldiers battle the evil robot ones. Oh yeah, and Rocksteady totally Mortal Kombat X-Ray moves Casey. Fatality it's also really great how they had a nod to the animation eras of the 87 series, with Mikey speaking out of wrath at one point. See? Cool but rude! I told you, dudes! Though, I do think it would have been funny to reference the episodes of the 2012 series where they didn't have the voice actor for a certain character, yet that character was in the episode and they just stayed strangely silent. This happened quite often with Baxter, so they could have had a funny, awkward moment of him just standing there, not saying anything to Shredder and Krang. Now at one point, Krang summons his rock soldiers from Dimension X, but it's the 2012 rock soldiers that show up. Do those guys even know 87 Krang? Like, what? Another nice thing about this crossover episode was they included Slash and Mondo Gecko, which of course are voiced by Corey Feldman and Robbie Riss. Yeah! Should still be pretty fair. Kinda makes me wish we could have had the original movie Turtles show up in some capacity, maybe at least as a cameo or something. Bebop and Rocksteady end up turning on Shredder and Krang when they reveal that they want to destroy the world, which is kinda out of nowhere as they talked about taking over the dimensions previous to this. Which kinda leads to another Bebop and Rocksteady forever moment as they save the day in a crossover again, though this time it was intentional. Bebop and Rocksteady are just the true heroes of all TMNT, I guess. There was a lot to enjoy about this arc, but if they had focused the story on bringing these characters into a more serious storyline, I think it would have fit with the rest of the season a lot better. The plot just needed to be a little bit less of a farce. The rest of the season had done such a good job on doing something different with the 2012 Turtles and going as dark as they could within this series limits, and it's a shame they didn't do the same thing with the 87 Turtles here. I've always wanted to see some more serious takes on the 87 Turtles, more akin to their first and last seasons, and this would have been the perfect opportunity to do that. 
It didn't need to be devoid of humor or anything, but I would have liked the stakes to have felt a bit more real, and having 87 Splinter in there would have added a lot of heart to the story. But as it is, it's very enjoyable, and it was nice to see and hear the 87 Turtles one more time. <laughs> So fake, that toy is gonna break. Fain and stall at me down. You need to be around. Grab that chocolate pizza. I even like it because I want to. Fail us, so fail us. Bring a mortar comedy. Fail us, so fail us. An animation movie. Fail us, so fail us. What we really is so fun. Fail us, so fail us. What's your opinion about? Cowabunga! Booyakasha!